Three, two, one. Manuel, I am delighted to welcome you to This Is Hate CD. I'm a longtime fan, first time speaker to you. <laughs> but let's start off and we'll we'll introduce yourself. So maybe tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do. I know you've written some incredible books, many of which I've just shown you before that I own them. Um, but let's start off. Where are you based and tell us what you do? So... Um... Yeah, well, thanks for having me. This is an uh, absolute pleasure, pleasure to be talking to you today. Uh, I'm currently based in Lisbon after almost, I think, 11 years living in New York. Um, right. So it's fun to be back in a, in a sun-filled Lisbon, and, we, and the weather is just fantastic here. And yeah. Food. So it's good to be back. And uh, what do I do? I mean, I think, I'm, I, I think of myself as a mix of a, a designer and writer. I think I was a writer before. I became a designer. Writing has been sort of like a, such a inerrant way of me making sense of the world around me and putting my thoughts together and emotions since I was an early kid. So I think I was probably a writer before I was a designer, but I, I would say I would put myself into those things. Awesome. Right. Your background, like, you know, I know you've, uh, you worked for Microsoft and Google and now you're working with, uh, Interos, um, you're probably working remotely, are you? Um, I am, yeah. Tell us, what you're, <laughs> Tell us what you're doing with Interos. It can be lonely, I have to say. I love the whole digital nomad lifestyle that it allows you to, to have, which is great. You know, no complaints. But yes, it can be lonely at times. So you have to balance that a bit. So yeah, so like you're saying, I spent over the years worked for advertising, you know, Small startups, large tech conglomerates like uh, Google's and Microsoft's of the world. And right now, I'm actually working for a startup based out of Washington, D.C. And in Terra's, we, what we do is we try to map the global supply chain. We have uh, 340 million companies in our database. And it's really painting the picture of how, uh, how that supply chain is all interconnected. So if you like networks, if you like systems, if you like data visualization. So when I heard about the company, what was the first approach about this job opportunity? I was like, this is me. This is my calling. This is like the best fit ever, you know, like leading yeah. a design team, working for a company that has like one of the most challenging, complex problems to, to deal with today, which is mapping you know, the global supply chain, which is like millions and millions of companies. And now they are interrelated and now they are interdependent, dependent on things like weather as well. So we're building a lot of new functionality uh, that we map, you know, things like weather events and how that's affecting supply chain. Uh, so it's it's really a, a fun, fun. Uh, so is problem. that a service you provide to clients that you, you map it, like in terrorist map it, it or is it a software? It is, it's a it service. Is a, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a platform, right? So it's, it's a SaaS, right? It's software as a service. So it's essentially a product, a, a digital platform that, yeah, you as a customer, you actually have your own uh, risk score. We can actually give you a score based on your entire supply chain. So okay. as a customer, let's say, and we have big clients like NASA and many others. So let's say that if you are a client of ours, you get to see your entire supply chain and you, feel, and you see like what are the, some of the most riskiest or the safest suppliers in your vast network. And we're not just talking about your direct suppliers, but your supplier suppliers, your supply suppliers. So when it comes to like tier one, two and three and even further down the chain. So you go, you have visibility on like hundreds and thousands of suppliers that are pertaining to what you. As a yeah, it's pretty cool stuff. <laughs> Depending at the Zoom level then that you're operating at from an organizational level, surely you might be able to see some interconnectedness between the other organizations. So one organizational level and another organization, you can see the overlap. Is that is that a potential for Interos? Uh, you mean like the relationship? Dependencies. We, the, the parent-child relationship? Yeah, parent-child. Yeah, absolutely. So we, we see relationships in various ways. One is certainly like between suppliers, like I, you are supplying something to someone else. Yeah. There's, you know, the parent-child, you know, like the ownership. Uh, so type of relationships, as we were saying. So when you go to large companies, let's say like Starbucks, you know, of course you have that, the major headquarters, but then you have Starbucks, yeah. you know, Ireland, Starbucks, Portugal, Starbucks, Spain. And then there's like multiple like, chains and branches and yeah and, and then we go back to the tree metaphor right yeah. what's that <laughs> only joking <laughs> so you you have the book of trees that's one of your, your right. books, and it um 
it's one of the books that I just showed it on a previous podcast that I record just before this one. And as it's one of the most beautiful books mm-hmm. uh, I think I own, okay. not just in terms of how it's designed, but in terms of actually how it's been put together. Like it's actually what is one of those books I showed you another one, Visualizing Complexity uh, by Darian Hill and Nicole. Another book that's just beautifully put together. Now, I want to ask you a little bit because like the, the nature of this conversation, we want to talk about designer's purpose and designer's impact. Your journey is a really interesting one. You've, you've kind of gone through Microsoft and, and Google, and now you're at that point. And the first couple of books that you produced were very visual intense. Okay, they were probably fair to say beautiful visualizations in there. And we're like, okay, Manuel knows how to uh, put a visualization together. There's no no doubt about that. But when I picked up this book and I got the advance, there's a lot of words on it. There's a lot. There's a, <laughs> so um, one of my friends, like, images, <laughs> <I'm pretty sure. laughs> not so, a single one, in fact. So one of my friends, when I told him, I said, "Oh, he's learned how to write," and I I couldn't stop laughing. I was like, "Well, I think." I think it's fair to say Manuel Lima knew how to write beforehand. It's not an assumption that you bought a keyboard and uh, you <laughs> you found a dictionary and just started to write in, in your 40s. Right. But this book looks like you've done an awful lot of reflection over the last uh, period of years. I want to understand your own journey and how you got to this point and why you're writing this book right now. Yeah, I think there's multiple reasons why, Gary. I think, well, I I did go through some sort of like a midlife crisis like four years ago. Nice. I'm going through that at the moment. We should talk. (laughs) I I think, to be honest, like I think, you know, that notion of a midlife crisis might seem maybe it's a little bit negative for for some people. But I think it's actually very positive. It's because it's a really... What really scares me is someone that says is in their 80s and saying to me that they never had a midlife crisis. Uh, yeah. And I say this because I think it's really an opportunity for reflection about what you're doing so far in your life and things that you don't want to do anymore, things you want to change, right? So I think that opportunity for reflection, call it a midlife crisis, call it something else. Of course, there are extremes, right? We all know this, the extremes. And those are the ones yeah, that motorbike. we laugh about and make fun of, of course. But generally speaking, like, you know, stopping mid-life, you know, midway through your life and thinking about, hey, what am I doing as an individual? Like, what makes me happy? You know, mm-hmm. uh, how do I run a span the rest of my years as a productive sort of professional, right? So I think all those are really, really meaningful reflections. So I went through that process. I think this is when I, I started thinking a little bit about, you know, this new book. I felt that when the Book of Circles was done, I kind of finished naturally like this phase in my life of like creating, not saying that I'm not going to go back to it, I might, yeah. finishing this phase of like really well-crafted, uh, very visually intense design systems types of books, right? And I think it finished because I started my first book talking about networks. Then mm-hmm. I wanted to go to the origin of things. That took me to trees. And then I wanted to go even further back because I'm always obsessed about the origin of things. And that got me to circles because it also got me to a point where I cannot go further back. (laughs) There's nothing. I mean, you know, that's that's really it. You know, some of the the most circular engravings you see on rocks, those are some of the earliest sort of like depictions, graphical Mm -hmm. depictions by humans, uh, ever documented, right? So it's hard to go what's before that. No one really knows for sure, right? So, and these are arguably the most popular metaphors. So I felt like it was a chapter in my life, both in terms of the themes that I was approaching, like this visual metaphors, but also the style of books that I was creating, to your point, right? Really well-crafted, visually intense. You know, each book has roughly 300, if not more images, right? So it's really, really heavy with imagery and, and visual delight. Yeah. So... I wanted to challenge myself. That was the second reason. Like I, I whenever I get too, too comfortable, like I know that it's time for to make a change, right? Yeah. Whatever that is, right? In terms of like work, in terms of like writing a book. So intentionally, I wanted to actually at, at some point throughout the writing of this book, I was thinking, you know, should I add a couple of diagrams here and there? It's like no, I actually want to challenge myself to a point that I'm not going to include one single diagram or image in this book. And let's see if it works, you know, let's see if it's sick. So th- that was another factor, just challenging myself because I really believe 
and it is it does sound a bit of a cliche but for me it has been a mantra for my life which is really life begins at the end of your comfort zone if you don't challenge yourself you never get to grow as an individual as a professional right so you have to get out of that comfort zone and again it got comfortable to me i knew how to put you know any of my previous books together it was not a challenge anymore i, I can i could do a fourth one or a fifth one if i wanted but then I think there was also reflection, not just on me as an individual, but also like in my practice and the experience that I had working in places like Google and Microsoft and Nokia, I was exposed to a lot of great experiences and I learned so much, but I also was exposed to things that were not ideal, you know, from a way, from our conception of design, what design stands for, the type of impact that we want to see in the world. And then of course, you know, you just turn on the news and you see everything that's happening around us from, yeah. you know, societal impact to environmental impact. And a lot of it is at the shoulders of designers. We cannot, you know, just remove ourselves from the equation and think that we are not responsible because we are. So that reflects all of those factors kind of uh, played a bit of a, a role in coming together with my, with, with this book. And, but I have to say that it's amazing when you have a great editor, like I had, uh, at MIT press that really always challenging to like go further, you know, explore this even deeper. And I think the book got to its current stage because I had someone like that on yes, the other hand, pushing, like always pushing me, pushing me. And that, that makes a huge difference. I feel. So talking about your purpose, like, you know, we, we, you wanted to challenge yourself, you identified that the grid edge of your career mm -hmm. is where the opportunity for, for personal and professional growth lie. How would you describe your own purpose and what uh, efforts did you go through to help refine and define that? Oh, wow. That's a great point. I actually wrote this down. This is how much of an OCD I am. At some point, as I was going through this midlife crisis, right, I had to put down almost like as you would do to a customer, if you're creating a brand, right, we have like a, brand mission, the vision, right? And let's say that if I was, you know, my own sort of brand, right? But just in the, the, the process of thinking, mm -hmm. what do I stand for? What makes me happy? What makes me like, you know, get out of the, the, the bad in the morning, right? Mm -hmm. So my mission, I'm actually reading this out loud to you. Go on. Be he's vulnerable. reading it. I can see, I can see his eyes moving left to right. <laughs> as he's looking for, looking for the pros, folks. So yeah. I, have, I have a mission. I have a tagline, what I need to be happy we can go over all of those, but my main sort of tagline is my mission is to use my passion and knowledge to inspire and educate others, to nurture clarity, curiosity, and determination, to promote a love for the unknown and the impossible, to elevate human culture and encourage new ways of thinking, to contribute yeah. to a more informed, humble, and inclusive world. That's my mission. <laughs> Very nice. Well, here's a question for you, because I've noticed over the last maybe 10 or 15 episodes that I've done with design leaders, they seem to circle back at some point in their career. And you taught at Parsons, mm -hmm. in, uh, where is it? I saw it somewhere 04, 05, or in around those years when uh, everything was a little simpler. What do you think that says about who you were in your earlier years? Were you always aligned to those kind of missions and you somewhat kind of grew out of it and then you fell backwards or mm. what what can we learn about our past and what what can we bring from our past into our present lives that's a great question i mean i think there's definitely a, a natural arc as you get older and more knowledgeable yeah. right you want to maybe share your knowledge with others younger versions of yourself and again if nothing else for them not to go through the same mistakes as you did right so like led us to a young self kind of a, a process so becoming a mentor, a teacher, I think those are very sort of uh, um, interesting pursuits for an individual that's somehow getting a bit older and, and more knowledgeable. I mean, for me, I always got, I think I got into the, like the conference circuit like really early. Uh, I think I was still in my master's, being a master at Parsons School of Design in New York. And I was maybe 26, 27 when I started doing conferences. Okay. And I got a huge kick out of that. It was really, really crazy. It was not so much being in the center that got me going, you know, like being, you know, looked stage. at or, or uh, just being at that in, in the stage itself. I think there's, there's certainly an appeal to it, but it was actually quite challenging. In the beginning, I was kind of shy 
and you know speaking in public was 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 a bit frightening for me so it, it took a bit of time to get used to it but for me it was really the the sharing of the knowledge right and being able to like touch other people's brains and as a light up would go in their heads, like that for me is fascinating. And to this day, I can do any project, anything, but nothing beats, you know, when someone sends me a message on LinkedIn or somewhere else and say, hey, I read this book or I saw this conference and I actually changed careers or I, I mm-hmm. went to this other direction and it changed my life. It changed the way I looked at design or data visualization. I've had instances like that. And for me, Wow, I mean that speaks volumes. That's like when you're actually touching someone at such a level, right? Mm. To actually for them to change their life in some substantial way, that's mm. impact, right? That's really fulfilling uh, for me as an individual. Do you think your purpose at 24 and 25 was the same as it is now? Mm, that's a good question. Has it evolved? Because this is a question yeah. I have with one of my coaches at the moment. They haven't really considered their purpose. And they're going through that process with me and my coaching program. And we're trying to identify their purpose. Right. And my question to you that co- comes after that is, if your purpose has remained static over those years, when you do define your purpose and it's in conflict with your current position as a designer, what advice do you give to people? Well, wow. well, that's a good. So answering the first question, I think I think it might have been I think it might have been the same. It was just a bit more unconscious and chaotic, right? It was just like going with the flow, right? And again, it it, it required a sort of like self reflection, yeah, called midlife crisis, whatever, for you to actually reflect about why you were doing this and why that got you excited, right? For me, for example, I was felt that just having a nine to five job was never enough. No matter how fulfilling that job was, I felt like I needed some sort of like a passion project to keep me going. Mm. I don't know, call it again, perfectionist. I'm always like, you know, I like to challenge myself to an extreme sometimes that causes me anxiety, but that it was that parallel project, that side project, that passion project that really got me through some of the bad times. And I also like, you know, my nine to five was always like successful, you know, like great job, yeah. you know, great places, great salaries, but there was never quite enough uh, for me. And so I, my recommendation for people is like always have a passion project because you never know if this passion project, you know, being a podcast, being like a, helping someone else, like doing a, a whole career could actually become your, your full time job, could actually become your thing. Right. Yeah. So I think in a way. It was kind of there, but you know, I, I didn't, I hadn't reflected enough because you know, when you are in your twenties and your thirties, you just like go, 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 go. You don't really stop to think about why you're doing things. Uh, at least that was the case for me. And your second question was, Gary, remind me again. If, if you're in conflict with your purpose, so if you're working, say, in an organization that might be, say, contributing to harm on the planet. You might be working for an oil company for argument's sake and you're like actually you know i don't realize that but this is this is a conflict to me and i'm aware that this conversation this conversation may come with a, a certain amount of privilege and being able to say get out of that job and get another place so i'd love to hear your your kind of thoughts on what people can do when you do yeah. define your your purpose and you realize I that it's a great, conflict i think that's a great point i mean i think generally speaking it's rare that you find like you know, a complete 100% conflict to a point that nothing you're doing makes sense to you, right? Uh, I would hate to be in those shoes. <laughs> I would hate for someone to be in those shoes because that that's pretty harsh. Okay. Yeah. That's a harsh reality, right? So I think there's always elements that you are kind of doing that are aligned with your purpose. So my feedback, generally speaking, is like, so double down on those, right? So I was reading this, this quote the other day of, you never really truly stressed or busy you're just doing less of the things that you truly love, right? So I think if you are facing this and if you feel like, you know, maybe your your nine to five job is not completely aligned with your purpose, like maybe start a passion project, right? That is aligned with your with your purpose, let's say. And then see yeah. where that goes, right? And try to double down on that. And if, you know, things might become incompatible, if that's the case, then there's many jobs out there and many of them are much closely aligned with your, your own purpose and mission, right? If you have already defined that. So that's, you know, another way to do it. But sometimes even starting off a, as a passion project, 
is a softer way for people to sort of explore that side of themselves that they feel it's more close to what they, they want to be doing. I want to understand a little bit more about your background, okay? Because the the need for a passion project, I, I align with you on that. It really can can feed parts of your life that are missing in your in your nine to five, as we'd say. But where does this come? Where where does this come from for you? Like this whole kind of, I don't want to say insatiable, but the whole kind of desire for helping others and working on passion projects and creating books and doing conference talks. What was your your formative years like that really led to this? And do you believe that those years, those formative years in your childhood and teenage years, are kind of still delivering that impact in your later life, well, your midlife, not later life? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, there's this this story that my mom keeps telling me that I was maybe six or eight, you know, and, you know, I'm from a yeah. generation probably, you know, not far from you that we didn't have, you know, <laughs> phones or Netflix, none of that. We just played outside with our friends, you know, riding our bikes yeah. and whatnot. So while my all my friends were out there, you know, just playing football, soccer, or playing with bikes, I was in-house just finishing the, the homework. But not just because it wasn't done already, because it was not perfect enough, right? And my mom is like, just go out. You know, your friends are out there. It's like, no, mom, it's not quite right yet. So that was always like space for improvement, which I think shows my kind of like perfectionist tendencies from an yeah. early stage. But I do remember like this moment when I actually finished uh, my master's. This was maybe again, I was like 25, 26 uh, at Parsons School of Design. And the master's, it's like a two-year uh, MFA, Master of Fine Arts. And it's so intense because you really don't have weekends. Yeah, of course, you, you do have fun as well with friends and drink, all of that. But it is pretty intense. There's a lot of disciplines. A lot of it is on the line notwithstanding the fact that we're actually paying a lot of money to be there, right? So you have to like... Yeah, absolutely. Make it Our sense is not cheap. Yeah, No, it's not cheap at all. So there was a lot on the line. So you have to, you know, really f- be, be invested. And it was hard, you know, all weekends working nonstop. And then I remember vividly, like when I started my first job at RGA, when RGA, RGA is like this large advertising agency, but back then, they only had their Google office, uh, their Google, their New York office, right? Right. Uh, a single office in New York City, uh, which was really fun to hang out with, uh, with all of them there. It was just a very different stage uh, for, for the company. Uh, and now they are like this BIMA. They, like, they have like offices everywhere, uh, you know, from Asia to, I mean, everywhere. So it is fun. Uh, when I started there, that was my first real job. I, I remember vividly, like, my first weekend on the job was like, what is this? I have, like, two full days that I have nothing to do. I just, like, get to, like, hang out. It was like, this is surreal. And for yeah. me, it felt like I was just being spoiled. I, you know, it's, it's hard to describe, but I felt like I had to do something with that free time. Yeah, uh, it, It's weird. And so that's actually when I started putting together a lot of the research that I did during my master's. And that became the, the body of work for visual complexity, the website first, and then the book, yeah. right? So from an early stage, I felt like, and I still feel that, and this is actually a good thing and a bad thing simultaneously. So I feel like anytime that I have five minutes truly relaxing, I feel guilty somehow that I'm like, hey, you know, I need to be something that's productive, either mentally or charging my body going to the gym, going to, you know, challenging my mind, doing something that's productive, sending this email or this message. So it is a little bit OCD. It, it definitely causes me anxiety. But the positive aspect is that, you know, it keeps you going. It's just like this never ending engine of like, let's do yeah. more, let's do this, let's do that, right? And and I think that is certainly something positive. Uh, otherwise, I would never have written a you know, book to begin with, which is a very stress-inducing type of process. Do you ever see yourself retiring, Manuel? No, absolutely not. I hate the word What's retirement. Your thought What's I, your thought I, I, on, yeah. on, on the framing of retirement? Because it's an interesting well, topic at the moment that I'd like to discuss a little bit more with, with you. Like, yeah. What are your thoughts on that whole mindset of retiring at 65? I think I, I really dislike the, the idea of retirement on its own. I think it's one, well, first of all, I see so much, so many people just like working their asses off, like all through life, waiting for that retirement age to come. 
and then you know they don't they are no longer healthy to actually enjoy retirement that's one aspect that i see and of course you, you must have seen cases like that all the time so this balance of like work and then enjoyment as like separate periods in your life i don't think that's the way you should live life at all because you know yes you can get sick and as probably as you get older there's a higher propensity for you to get health issues right so by the age of retirement you're probably going to get some pain here and some pain there that could actually cause you many issues Absolutely. that will not even allow you to go to the places that you want. Uh, I think that's one aspect that of retirement that I think is, is somehow frustrating to me, but then it's all this idea that you get to unplug your brain, right? Somehow like, Hey, retirement's like, I don't get to do anything for me doing anything as I, I was just mentioning scares the hell out of me, scares me more than anything else. Like, what do you mean do nothing? I, it, it would be, and we know, again, there's actually uh, various cases uh, like that. And now we know that it's the worst thing for you to really like die sooner than you should is by disconnecting yourself from, from the world, right? Like do nothing, not feeling productive. I think all of us, you know, men and women, we need to feel like we are contributing to something. And, and if that sense of contribution comes solely from your work, and then all of a sudden you unplug that drive from your life, Oof, that's a, that's that's a perfect recipe for you to like have mental issues and health issues because those things are also yeah. always related. So I think retirement for me will will not exist. You know, hopefully I want to live my life in a very balanced way. That yes, work is important, but also like enjoying work, work, going to the beach, hanging out with my kids. Those will happen simultaneously throughout my life, right? So yeah. someone actually, I was having lunch yesterday with someone. It's like, hey, are you? In vacation or are you working? It's like, you know, I actually like to mix them both. You know, every I try to mix both every single day. So every single day does not feel like it's either one or the other. You have, you know, work and pleasure. This this intertwining sort yeah. of like type of, of existence for me is much more fulfilling. Uh, but also like, I, I don't think I, I will stop ever doing the kind of stuff that really gets me going. You know, you saw my tagline, like inspiring others, like either through books, through a podcast, maybe I'm going to, one day be yeah. courageous isn't enough to actually do my own podcast. Whatever the means or platform that will exist 20 years from now, who knows, my God. Can you imagine yeah. 20 years from now? We AI, Absolutely. how are we gonna, what kind of mediums we're gonna be using to like inspire other people? Whatever it yeah. exists 20 to 30 years from now, I hope I will still be there. And be relevant. And, 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 yeah, having a sense of, of of, you know, contributing to something, you know, that's going to be super important for my mental and physical health. Yeah. I, I, I watched an interview recently with uh, a, a Nikigai special, or I'm probably not saying that word correctly, but um, they said that without your purpose, and if you retire, the whole mindset of retiring at 65, um, when you retire, and if you don't have that purpose in place, you're three times more likely to suffer from serious illness or death. And I was like, wow. Okay, so the, you see it all the time of people, they retire and then they get sick and, you know, and ultimately can lead to death. Like it's too often. So they only retired a couple of years ago and now all of a sudden like they died. And I've always, similar to yourself, always had that belief that, you know, I, I don't think I'm ever going to retire. I'm always going to be doing what I'm doing. Don't know if I'm going to be doing a podcast when I'm 75, but I think I'll be doing <laughs> something along the same lines. But let's talk a little bit more around impact, okay? Because I loved. Sorry, yeah, what were you saying? Me. No, just to that point, Gary. I love uh, people like Don Norman, for example. In that context, Don Norman, you, as you know, right? If you are into yeah. design, you know his work and and himself as as a as a design sort of you know big figure. I mean, he's now I think eighty four or eighty five. Is running the messages? Yeah, he's like he just wrote a book. Actually, kind of, you know, in a very similar vein to ours, we are hoping to have a panel together, like in Milan, I think this year. Uh, he's very active on email, very active on LinkedIn. It's like, he's 85, you know, it's like 10 years older than my dad. And I find that those cases, but again, like, I, I, that's how I see myself. Like, not, never like, yo, you know, or I'm, I'm too old to like do something like that. You know, it, it really cripples you when you start thinking in those terms, right? Like, I'm retired, I'm too old to do something. It's like, just just go with it. Just go with the flow. Don't, don't you know, 
uh, stop yourself from you know aspiring for more right and i think that's really important yeah absolutely you mentioned about your impact in that tagline i think it was really around having an impact and you mentioned about the the enjoyment you get from having people say to you that they read the book and change careers and stuff there was different facets of impact that you define which i really liked about societal impact human impact business impact which impact excites you the most and you know how does that align to the purpose that's a great point so I was debating a lot about how to, you know, organize the book initially. You know, I, I, at some point I gravitated towards this idea of myths, right? Like myths that are worth debunking, deconstructing, right? Yeah. There are kind of like uh, really shackles, right? They are really shackling uh, designers from achieving their true greatness, right? And, and impact, but the impact that they think they deserve. And I divided between personal impact, societal impact, and environmental in- impact. I, you could argue that the first section, personal impact, was perhaps not as urgent or needed compared to like societal impact. Absolutely. And impact. Yeah. But you have to start with yourself, right? You, I mean, it's like, again, putting your mask on on a plane, right? It's You have to like be good with yourself, with your purpose, with your sense of mission, understanding your capabilities, your skills, right? And how far you can go before you can do anything for others be yeah. humans, society, or the environment, right? So that that first sort of like section was really important to me. Of course, environmental is a given, you know, and, and I explain a lot on that, like why we need to think more in systems, you know, like there's no local design anymore. But I would actually say societal impact is, is at the moment the, the thing that scares me the most because it, it, and I think another factor that, you know, got me to write the book is, the negative inf- impact that we are having on people's minds through technology. Yeah. And it got me thinking, and, and not just human adults, but but kids, you know, and I have two young girls and I'm very scared, not just, of course, the, the crazy teenage years that are upon me, <laughs> that will end. <laughs> it happened with multiple generations, but like what technology is causing to young teenagers, right? Especially girls, right? The rate of suicide, you know, like body image, all those issues. Like, I'm very scared of that. Yeah. And many designers are actually behind a lot of the things that uh, are causing things like depression, you know, rates of, of, of anxiety in teens, you know, and even suicide. So that worries that worries me a lot. Um, and that's, you know, one of the, the, the sections that I had is about how technology can be, uh, and design, of course, not necessarily a... Uh, um, a source of good, right? Uh, it can actually be a, a source mm. of, of, of many evil things. As so, well. what are you doing about this? Like, uh, and feel free to to dodge this question, yeah. you know, but for someone who has gone through a sort of a an evolution, I guess, over the last God, you've been around for nearly twenty years, practicing nearly as long as me. But how do you how do you remain? centered in your purpose like what what are these steps that you're using to to align yourself to that purpose in your career because you're in the new role i think maybe it's a year and a half is it something in in interest so um you mentioned there that you you had to see change and you've got a a new role but i want to understand a little bit more around how you make sure that you're still aligning to that purpose well, so I, I continue doing my, my what I, I would say is, is my passion project, right? So, you know, writing books, attending conferences, and that gives me a lot of joy for sure, right? But then in my nine to five job, uh, I also get a lot of joy out of that, you know, spe- specifically just collaborating with people. We always look back at, at a lot of the things we did in our past jobs. And I think for the most part, it's not so much the projects we worked on, but it's the people we worked with, right? Yeah. That, that are the ones that really, you know, we have fond memories of. So I think that is a, a really strong component. But, you know, going back to your question, I think, I think I would say two things. One is questioning and awareness. So awareness is really important because sometimes designers, you know, I see this all the time, especially young designers, they, they leave college and they want to do all this great impact. And then they get placed in, you know, one of the tech giants 
and they find themselves working in a very mini school type of problem. They get really frustrated because they're not doing what they were uh, meant to be doing, according to them. But also because they don't have a lot of visibility on, on the, the, the larger thing that they are actually creating, right? So I ask a lot of these questions in the book because I'm fascinated by the why. I always ask the why. Yeah. So yes, it's easy to say, why is, is this like a moral failing on the part of designers worldwide, right? And it's not just, again, uh, fashion designers, you know, contributing, you know, creating all this, you know, seasons for yes. fast fashion. It's not just industrial designers, which is actually my background, creating all these evil, you know, products, oh, you know, plastic bottles and yeah, all of that. Yeah. It's also digital designers. We have a huge responsibility and it's too easy for us to like point the finger to someone else when I think every design role has some responsibility, uh, both mm -hmm. for society and environment. And so I think it starts with awareness, awareness that, hey, sometimes you might not actually be looking at the big, big picture. Sometimes the way, even the way that you are being evaluated in terms of like, what do you actually get to launch? How many things you get to launch versus how many things actually landed, right? How many things are actually affecting society or the environment in a good way? Mm -hmm. Those things are never considered, right? So I, I, went, I worked at places where your salary, your bonus is in exclusively dependent on of how many things you put up. It doesn't matter if these things are good or bad. It's just the, the number, right? Yeah. And to continue launching, you know, design solutions into like this vacuum of consequences is absolutely irresponsible, right? So Absolute. first of all, be awareness. Irresponsible. Of irresponsible. Ir yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So be aware of this, like traps. These are mental traps. These are biases, sometimes even an unconscious bias on your part that you're not really even looking or you might be contributing to something that's not, that doesn't have the type of positive impact that you want to have in the world, right? So can I just stop you yeah. on that point? Like in in the uh, the example you're given there about working for an organization that contributes and putting things out in a vacuum and you're rewarded for that that behavior, what kind of things would you advise people to do? And what did you do? Because I can probably identify the organization that you're talking about from your LinkedIn. <laughs> um, <laughs> what, <clears throat> I won't say it. But anyway. But it's not even um, the, exclusive to them. It's, it's all, you know, Silicon Valley has absolutely. operated. So, uh, it's, it's the mindset. Say. It's the mindset. You know, it's, it's what is it? Build and, you know, break fast. You know, go and yeah, fail fast. break things and fail fast. And it's all this. Yes, I mean, there's certain good aspects of it. Yeah, we need to trial and fail and learn and, and do it again. But I think sometimes, you know, we, we are creating things that are truly detrimental to society and, and the human mind, especially when we are deciding intentionally to exploit the human mind for, for profit. And that's yeah. what we do often. But on that point, Manuel, like yeah. people within organizations, they do one or two things. They try and challenge that within the organization or they leave. Now, in terms of challenging it, people might say, well, I'm only one designer as within an organization that's a quarter of a million people. What, what chance do I have to kind of start that conversation off and evoke the movement within the organization? Do you feel it's possible for a designer to have that uh, potential to start the movement? It's a loaded question, and you better say, yeah. Yeah, well... I'm not, I'm not going to sugarcoat it and say, yes, yeah. it's absolutely easy. I know it's not easy, but of course it's possible. We have to believe it's possible because, you know, if there's been any social movement that we, we, we are, we appreciate from the past, it started normally with one single person, right? Yeah. And those ideas contaminate others and spread and change happens eventually, right? Any big social movement has happened, you know, from women's rights to like racial inequality, like all those things start with a single idea, with a single person and things. So even by looking at the past, you know, you don't have to be sort of uh, dismissive of this completely because even from looking at the past, we know it's possible. It has happened multiple times in, in our history. But of course, it, it is challenging. But I think what it, it's better to be aware that these things are happen and and then try it. And then if you fail, that's fine. You can move somewhere else. There are many jobs out there. I was just even on another podcast the other day. There are, fortunately today, you're not constricted to this type of role, right? When I, you know, when I started working, advertising was one of the few places that actually allowed some creative output and paid really well. It's not the case anymore. You have countless of startups actually doing great environmental work 
that are paying equally as well as many large Silicon Valley companies, right? So you have options today. You are not constrained to like, just do this, right? Because the worst that can happen is when you turn off your brain, right? When, and this is like the, a great form of moral disengagement. And this is what the big companies want. It's like, they want you to be morally disengaged from the discussion. Just do your job, don't question. So it's being, again, awareness and questioning. You have to question, like, why are we doing this for? Like, whose purpose are we serving? Like, how is this helping humans? Like, how, are they, how is this being used? Like, what kind of app will this create? Are we researching, like, the long-term effects of this? Like, question nonstop. Because if you are contributing to something, it's in your duty. It's your, your own sort of responsibility to actually question how this is going to be used and what's the effect that this will cause in the world outside both Absolutely. socially and environmentally. So question is the ultimate form of ethics. You cannot have ethical behavior if you're not questioning. So when people say, and you see this all the time, that's another thing that I, I don't know if you want to talk about this, like yeah, yeah. The, hiring yeah. of, the hiring of ethicists by Silicon Valley is one thing today that really, really I'm highly against. And I'm highly against because, first of all, it, it really is a facade. It's a smokescreen because as soon as these people come in, they are put literally in the corner, metaphorically in the corner, where they don't have a lot of control over anything on making any change. Yeah. It, when they start investigating, they actually are pushed aside or actually fired. This has happened multiple times over the past years, right? Actually get fired by doing their jobs. But the worst, more pernicious fact, and again, an, another form of moral disengagement is when these are used for others not to think, not to reflect upon what they are actually doing, right? So this is something, uh, yeah, you come to me, Gary, as you, and as a designer say, hey, I don't actually agree with this. This is, we're not doing the right thing. We should consider this. And then the, the sort of the rationale is you don't have to worry about that. We have someone else to worry for that to worry about that for you. We have a, we just hired an ethicist, you know? They it's their responsibility, their job, responsibility to worry about ethics. That is really, really scary because all of a sudden what you're told is like, just go back to your desk, go back to coding, designing, whatever you do, and let the ethicist worry about ethics. When it's absolutely wrong, ethics belongs to all of us. Absolutely all of us. And we have that responsibility. Absolutely. One of my final questions, Manuel, and then you can go and get your lunch <laughs> in the middle of the day. <laughs> I, I, I was speaking to somebody recently in my own personal network, and they said that you're the sum of your five friends. And I really loved that because like, who you surround yourself with is really, really important for your own mental health, your own stimulation for your personal and professional growth. Mm-hmm. Is it okay if you give us a shout out to the five people that you believe uh, that you are the sum of? Ooh, I, it's hard to always name names. Oh, first of all, because I will your always mother. forget someone. Your mother. That. Your but mommy. I, your mommy. <laughs> Gary's mother. Mrs. Mrs. Lima is listening. She is waiting for you to say her name. Exactly, exactly. Mommy Lima. It's very easy. You just say mommy. If, if you, if you, if you, this is actually one huge trigger for anxiety for me. It's this one. Mommy. You know, yeah, putting names on public and then forgetting about some, but a uh, huge trigger. But I will tell you this, like, I, I don't know if this is the same, if others, you know, f- uh, feel the same way, but I tend to look for friends that are somehow different from me, or uh, I think there's a form of admiration. I think in any relationship, my mom actually told me this a while back. And I think the more I think about it, it there's definitely a lot, an element of truth that, Every relationship, no matter what it is, friendship, uh, love relationship, um, mentor, mentee, whatever it is, there is to, there, you have to have a degree of admiration for this other person. And when, you know, it stops cracking, that's when relationships start kind of like uh, distancing themselves and from each other. It's when that admiration starts cracking, you know? So for me, admiration can be someone that has a trait that I don't have. Like, let's say maybe someone that's really calm, that has this really soft-spoken voice. I, I love people like that because I'm not like that. So I tend to, like, gravitate towards people that don't have the same traits as I do, right? I have no emotion. 
you know, <laughs> rob us, <laughs> basically. That's yeah, why I, I'm, AI. my the, all the, the AI bots are my friends. I'm gonna yeah. uh, when you were saying about names, yeah. her, <laughs> her, yeah, ChatGPT is my best friend. <laughs> Never argues, never disagrees. Never disagrees, but like... You are great, my <laughs> How was your night last night? You slept really well. <laughs> I know, but, you know, it's it's hard to put people on pedestals. And I, I, that's something that I try never to do uh, at all, because I think we are all humans, we are all flawed. But I think there's a an ongoing, an ongoing struggle in life. And I think for me, it's the ultimate struggle, which is having control over your own mind. Right, having because it's the only thing you can really truly have control over. It's your thoughts, your perceptions of others, of yourself. You know the way you look at the world. Like all of this is all in here in our own brain, right? So having some control over it is absolutely empowering. So I'm very much fascinated by people that apparently, and I know sometimes it's just an appearance because inside there are like. As chaotic as we are, yeah. but I do tend to gravitate towards people that are, and I think calm is even somehow a reflection of that. Just you know, being you know positive, true to themselves, you know, at ease. You know, this at ease with the present, not anxious, not uh, you know frustrated, not aggravated, but like that sense of inner peace for me is something that I really admire in others. Yeah, okay. um, Somehow. Very good. Yeah. You kind of dodged the question, but I'm going to let you off. <laughs> like Manuel, but anyway, uh, Manuel, we're, we're at the end of the episode. I'm conscious uh, of the time as well, but the book is coming out soon. When is it out? In May, is it? It is. May the 2nd. May, May the 2nd. second. Why, you may, why didn't you put it out in May the 4th? It, it could have been May the 3rd because that's actually my birthday. That would even be May better. May the be with you. You could have, you could have had <laughs> Star Wars launches. I know, I know. Can you imagine? We're to MIT now and say, we're changing it to the fourth. We missed an opportunity. May the fourth be with you. This is your mission, the new design. That's like success guaranteed. Come on, May 4th is a marketing team and MIT are like, we missed it. No. <laughs> I'll put a link to the book. Is there is there a, a place where people can pre-order? Absolutely. I mean, of course, Amazon, all the big sellers, of course, MIT Press, you can just go there and you can yeah. pre-order. Yeah, we are just like, I guess, maybe two weeks away from it, which is really yeah, exciting. Yeah, absolutely. So this will probably be out a little bit after that. Yeah. We'll, we'll I, just got, I just got a UPS email this morning that I think my actually my hard copies are coming my way. So I'm going to... Got them pretty soon. I'm very excited about it. Very nice. Very nice. nice. Well, look, Manuel, thank you so much for giving me the time. I know you're a busy man um, and really best of luck with the book. It is, I, I'm halfway through it and I'm really enjoying it. Um, so, you know, come back on the podcast when you have your next one or if you want to discuss more things that related to the book, you're always welcome here in This Is Hate City. So thanks so much for your time. Thanks, Gary. Appreciate it.